According to Shannon Popkin, nothing phases God. The storms in our life, He isn't affected by the chaos. None of it affects Him. He is above the storm. He is standing and He wants us to see that in the middle of our storm. He's our anchor. You're listening to the Revive Our Hearts podcast for October 31st, 2023. Our host is the author of Lies Women Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free, Nancy DeMoss Walker. Do you ever feel like you're barely keeping your head above water? Like wave after wave keeps hitting you and you're worried that you're going to drown. I've often said that You're either in a storm right now, or you just came out of one, or you're about to head into one. That's life in our fallen world. It's life this side of heaven. That's why when we face choppy waters, we need to learn to stay anchored so we're not driven along by the winds and the currents. In Hebrews chapter 6, we read about a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Do you know what the author is referring to? It's the promises of God and the hope we have because of what Jesus has done for us. On this day in 1517, the Protestant Reformation was born. In many ways, the Reformation was a way of throwing out an anchor for a ship that had drifted off course. What Martin Luther and many other reformers did was to say, we're going to anchor our lives and our churches to Christ and to the Word of God. The scriptures, the written word of God, and Jesus, the word made flesh, they are our only authority and hope. Not the traditions of the church, not human opinions. We're going to go with what the Bible says over everything else, and we're willing to risk our lives to do it. And they did risk their lives, so today we could have the word of God. And on this day, when believers celebrate a return to affirming salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, on the authority of the Word of God alone, to the glory of God alone, we wanted to spend some time meditating on where or to what we're anchoring our souls. We have a wonderful group of friends here to help us do that, and I'll be introducing them as we go. Yesterday on Revive Our Hearts, we heard from Asherita Choo Choo. She described the time she first experienced a panic attack. Here's Asherita. My thought with the anchor holds would be going to that laundry room moment two weeks into the pandemic when I felt like my world was falling apart and I can't do this anymore. And God meeting me in such a special and personal way that He is my refuge and He is my strength. And no matter what life brings, when we rest on the rock that is Jesus Christ, we are safe and secure. The waves might crash, the storms might come, all this unknown. You can't anticipate the diagnosis, the job loss, the loved one walking away. We don't know what will come. But God knows, and He invites us to build our life on the solid rock because He will never be shaken. And so when we rest in Him, we will not be shaken. Asherita Choo Choo isn't the only one who's felt the need to anchor her soul to the Lord in moments of anxiety. Here's Glenna Marshall sweet friend who has struggled with chronic pain for many years as a result of two different kinds of severe arthritis. During some of the earlier days of my disease, before I actually knew what was wrong with me, I had a night of pain that is still etched in my memory. The pain was so severe that I had a panic attack. And I remember clearly just walking the floors in my living room, praying and crying out to the Lord. And I was reminded of the story in Matthew where Jesus asks Peter to come out of the boat and walk on the water with him. And I just picture Peter like jumping over the side of the boat like people jump out of a convertible, (laughs) just legs over, swinging himself out, so impulsive and excited to walk on the water with Jesus. And he walks out and 
he's on top of the water and it's raging, tempest, and he suddenly looks around him and he starts to sink and he cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus rebukes his weak faith while also saving him. And then Jesus walks him back to the boat and he, that's when he calms the storm. Peter has to walk back to the boat in the storm. And I remember that story in the middle of the night that night, and I just cried out with Peter, Lord, save me. I don't know what else to say, except that my faith is struggling in this fear, in this pain. And while he did not heal me that night, he helped me survive the night. My heart calmed. I was able to eventually go back to sleep. And I remember the next morning just dwelling on that story and going back to the scriptures to read it. And Peter's faith was really, really small in that moment. But the object of his faith was really, really big. And it was Jesus. And He is the sure and steady anchor, as we know from Hebrews 6. Our faith might feel really, really weak at times. He is the one that's strong. And so if we're just continually turning back to the one is, who is strong, we can be reminded that He is holding fast to us. I mean, He holds us fast. And I think that is what's encouraging when we're unsure, when we're afraid. We don't necessarily have to depend on our own strength. We just lean really hard on His. And He doesn't disappoint. Such a sweet reminder there from Keith and Kristen Getty. And just before that, we heard from Glenna Marshall. Now here's Kristen Getty telling about a time in the summer of 2022 when she especially needed to look to Jesus to be her anchor. It was a lot going home this year. The international travel, the Sing Conference, the album, and we also moved house this year. So a lot of different things went on, and that's see, it was sort of a cumulative effect of a lot of stress points and feeling just a bit lost with the, with the burden of all of that and the girls starting to school. And I think what I felt was I was so busy doing all these very good things, but felt sort of a little um, vulnerable in my tiredness and vulnerable in being a little cut off because I didn't have as much time to invest in relationships that spoke in. And so I just find myself feeling a little hollowed out, that there was so much going out and not enough coming in. And I, I started to feel that a lot a couple of weeks ago, I think, just at the end of the SING conference, I just felt this. And I was able to pick back up again the last couple of weeks with a, a morning Bible study that I have with a couple of friends, another Bible study in my church, and actually reading Dean Ortland's devotional book with the Psalms of the Psalms. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. It's... And um, I was reading again over Psalm 4, and it was a psalm that he talked about that is, a, you know, a quiet trust in God during troubling times. And I just worked my way through it and pulled out some of the thoughts, tried to rephrase it in a sort of an old Scottish um, psalm setting of a hymn to try and get it stuck in my, in my brain. And it was just, just lots of glasses of water. The whole thing was just... It was just incredible, and um, I read through those notes again today as preparation for being part of today, and it just, it, it was it was amazing. So I think that in times of a lot of, of, you know, acute busyness, when you're pouring out so much, you can be your most vulnerable, and that, that reminder, it doesn't matter how old you're, how long you've been a believer, to constantly be finding ways to fill up again. And um, so this, this last week has been all about that. When I feel Christ will hold me fast When the tempter would prevail He will hold me fast I could never keep my hold Through life's fearful path For my love is often cold He must hold
For Julie Slattery, the metaphor changes from nautical to aeronautical. I think the vision that God has really given me over the years with this is the idea of being an instrument-rated pilot, which if you know aviation, it means that you can trust the instrument panels and you're not going to be thrown off by what you see out the windows. And I think in our day and age, there are so many women who are looking out the windows, they're looking inward at what they feel, what people are saying, what culture is doing, and they don't trust the instrument of God's Word. And so for me, it's that God never changes. His Word never changes. He's never surprised. And as much as we might be bumping around in turbulence, we can trust Him. We can trust uh, His Spirit as He teaches us and He draws us to Himself. I love that. Thank you, Julie Slattery. Now, back to the anchor theme. This is Amanda Cassian. She says the concept of our anchor holding to Christ reminds her of one of her children. And she, too, points us to the biblical account of Peter walking on the water. I named my daughter, my youngest daughter, Josephine Hope. And the word or the name Josephine means God increases. And she's a COVID baby. So at the time, I was really struggling with hope and, you know, where our security lies because the world was changing so fast and people were turning on each other. And I wanted a reminder of God's Word and and who He is. And so her name is Josephine Hope, which means God increases hope. And as I age, as my years come to an end, and it could come to an end tomorrow, God is further increasing my hope as I come to know Him more. And that hope is an anchor for me. It is a hope that I don't have to worry about tomorrow. When I think of Peter stepping out of the boat, when he fixed his eyes on Christ, his anchor, he could walk on water. But when he looked to the right or to the left, that's when he sank. And so for me, I want to fix my eyes on Christ, who is the anchor of my soul, so that I do not sink. He keeps me afloat. Shannon Popkin explains that same passage in greater detail. There's this night when the disciples are crossing the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus has told them to cross. They're following His instructions, and they find themselves in the middle of a storm. Like, it's a bad storm. They're afraid that they're going to lose their lives. And they have been out there battling. It says the wind and the waves were against them. And they are feeling completely undone. They're, they're afraid they're going to die. And at like between 4 and 6 in the morning, I think it's the third watch of the night, Mark tells us that Jesus came walking on the water, and He meant to pass by them. Now, I think that's interesting (laughs) because when I'm in the dark night of the soul, the chaos of a storm, I don't want Jesus to pass by me. I want Him to come to me. I want Him to stop the storm. I want Him to be with me in the storm. And yet, Jesus meant to pass by them. What was He thinking? This was the big reveal. In Matthew's telling of the story, at the end of the story, the disciples say, Surely He was, is the Son of God. They're knowing for the first time that, yes, everything is insecure in our lives. And yet, we shouldn't picture Jesus, I don't think, like slogging through the storm, (laughs) you know, trying to get to them. Because if He's not affected by gravity, surely He's not affected by the storm. And this is what Jesus is revealing. He is not affected by the storms in our life. He isn't affected by the chaos. None of it affects Him. He is above the storm. He is standing, and He wants us to see that in the middle of our storm. He's our anchor. He's the anchor that we can look to in the middle of our storm. Um, He's the one who will not be defeated. He will rise above anything that we are facing. And so in our distress, in our frustration, Jesus wants us to see, you know, we might be out of control. Our whole world may be out of control. But Jesus is not in out of control. Jesus is in control. And so since He is in control, that means I don't have to be. We're hearing from some of the speakers who shared at our most recent True Woman Conference. We asked them what comes to mind when they think about Jesus and the Scriptures being our anchor. 
Here's Kelly Needham. I've seen the anchor hold in my life in my own heart's transformation, um, which always feels like the hardest transformation sometimes. But to take seasons of change, to take hurts and conflict and problems that feel too big to solve in my own heart, to take those to the Lord and see my own heart transform from a place of turmoil to peace, that is so affirming to me that God is real, that He can change me, He can change my disposition, that He can produce peace in my heart amidst a lot of moving things that are unstable and uncertain. And starting to see Him answer prayers that I'm praying for. And not all of the things that have been laid before His feet this past 12 months are answered. But there are some that have been. And there's slow transformation in, in some areas and relationships and things that I've been praying for that I see. And seeing those those little expressions of God at work, it's just a reminder, He is real and He is He's changing me, first of all, but I see Him transforming others around me. It's not always the circumstances that I want changed that get changed. It's usually heart postures that are getting changed and contentment growing rather than circumstances changing. But again, that to me is more freeing because now my hope is tied not to circumstances changing, but to a person who can actually interject into a difficult circumstance and provide the things that we need despite the circumstance changing. It's really liberating. For Erin Davis, there's not one anchor, but two. I'll let her explain. I'm going to take you back to a coffee shop a few years ago. I was counseling a college-age friend of mine who was struggling with daily anxiety. She was struggling to go to class. Um, she wasn't taking good care of herself. And, and another friend of mine and I had just kind of talked at her <laughs> for several minutes, and it wasn't getting through to her at all. And finally, I said to her, hey, do you believe that God is good? And she said, I do. And I said, do you believe that God is in control? And she said, not really. And that was just the root of everything she was feeling. Can you imagine if you believe there's a God in heaven, you believe he has all of this power, you believe he created all things, but somehow it's all out of his control right now? And um, so that began this journey for me of seeing God's goodness and God's sovereignty as two anchors. And to try and help better serve her, I Googled one day, when does a boat need two anchors? Which is a strange thing to Google, but I just had a hunch. And the answer is in a storm. Because if you just have one anchor in a storm, your boat's gonna spin and spin and spin. Uh, where if you have two anchors, those anchors are gonna counterbalance each other and hold each other, hold the boat steady. And that's what I saw in my friend's life. She, she knew one thing about God, that he was good, but she didn't believe the other thing about God, which is that he was in control. And if you only believe one or the other of those, your boat's gonna spin and spin and spin. So for me, the anchors, plural, are God is good. Scripture says he is good, he does good, uh, he withholds no good thing, it's who he is. So that anchor's in the ground for me, and he's sovereign. He's in control, nothing gets past him, nobody can manipulate him, no, no, but there can't ever be a coup in heaven uh, where he loses his authority. And those things, I've lived it in my life, especially this past year or so, they hold, even in a really intense storm. So when I hear our anchor holds, I think our anchors hold, uh, and I'm so grateful they do. I'm actually excited. This is Nancy Lindgren. Because I think through hard times, through suffering, it takes us to our knees and it makes us so dependent on God. And it's true in my own life. I've had to rely on Him. You know, it's not when it's easy, we don't rely on Him. When it gets harder, we have to rely on Him. And so the hard times bring us closer to Him and I'm all for that. And I think it's good that we're drawn to Him and we're needy. We desperately need Him. I think that's a good thing. And so I wanna be in that place where I'm not, life isn't just all easy and good. I wanna be so dependent on God that He shows up and I know it's Him and it's nothing of me. Thank you, Nancy Lindgren. 
Now Blair Lynn shares her thoughts on that phrase, our anchor holds. What comes to mind when I think our anchor holds is I think that God is my anchor. <laughs> you know, Christ is our stabilizing anchor that keeps us. You know, Christ is what has brought us in relationship with our Heavenly Father. Um, it's being filled with the Holy Spirit, being filled with all the fullness of God. <laughs> so that's what I think of when I think of an anchor. Hmm, reminds me of what we talk about a lot here at Revive Our Hearts, freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ. And if I could, I'd love to take a moment to just quickly share a passage that has served as an anchor for me in recent years. I've gone back to these two verses again and again and again. They've been an anchor for me, an anchor for my heart, an anchor for my runaway emotions, an anchor for my rogue thoughts and imaginations, all the what-ifs, especially during those crazy days of 2020. You remember that when the world was shut down with the pandemic? And also when my sweet husband, Robert, was diagnosed with two different cancers, with months of surgeries, chemo treatments, and more. These verses were a lifeline, an anchor to my heart then, and they continue to be now. It's the last two verses of Psalm 29, and here's what it says. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned king forever. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Whew, it helps my heart just reading that now. I won't take the time to unpack each phrase today. I've done that elsewhere. In fact, you can listen to a two-day series I recorded back then called Coronavirus, Cancer, and Christ. You'll find a link to it in the transcript of this program at reviveourhearts.com. But maybe you need to hear this today. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. I don't know what your flood is. I don't know what's threatening to overwhelm you. But I can tell you this on the authority of God's word. God is still in control. I received just a few weeks ago an email from a friend who's in the midst of a massive storm right now. Wave upon wave, chaos going on in her life related to an adult child. She wrote me, and, and she ended the email this way. She said, I'm relearning that our lives belong to Him. He has never left us nor forsaken us. Yes, we see the goodness of God in each day, and we name that goodness out loud to each other. Exhausted? Yes. Weary? Yes. Peace? Joy? Well, to be honest, she said, they both come and go. But staying in His Word to receive His thoughts about how to live our lives, staying close to Him, gives us strength for each new day. Heaven rules. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. Maybe you need to remind yourself of that promise today. Anchor your soul to that truth. Well, it's been so encouraging to hear different perspectives, one after the other, on that one concept— that the Word of God is our anchor. So good. We have one more to share today. Dr. Catherine Butler had the opportunity to help a friend remember and anchor his soul to the promises of God. I think the one that leaps to mind is my friend David, um, whom I write a lot about in my book, Glimmers of Grace. He was just a wonderful brother in Christ. He was a dear friend of mine who, even though I have over a decade of experience in clinical medicine, probably taught me more than anyone else about what it means to face illness with faith. He had end-stage emphysema, and he had um, HIV as well. And I walked with him and had the privilege of being alongside him during his last few months of life. And he's someone who had already seen God's work abundantly in his own life. He struggled with a period where he was homeless on the streets of New York City for a decade. And it was a good Samaritan, is what he used the, the term, who found him when he was about to take his life on the streets of New York and told him the gospel and then walked him to Bellevue Hospital for him to get help. 
And it was the first time David really understood the gospel and understood Jesus' love for him because this stranger saw him as an image bearer of God, packed with potential were his words, and escorted him to help. And he dedicated his life to Jesus thereafter. And he was in and out of the hospital frequently because of his medical issues, but he would evangelize to the staff. He would bring a stack of Spanish translation Bibles to give to the staff that was helping him on a daily basis. He would send emails to our church proclaiming God's goodness even while he was struggling. So it was very jarring for me to see in his last few months he got sicker and sicker and was in this pattern of bouncing back and forth between the hospital and rehab and never getting home. Or he'd get home for a day and then we'd find him unconscious because his breathing was so terrible that his carbon dioxide levels kept rising too high. And it started to wear on him and it started to crush his spirit. And I remember my heart breaking for him one day because this man who was so stalwartly in the faith and had so much assurance of God's goodness was crippled by just the weariness and the pain of being sick and being bound in the hospital for months. And he started to doubt God's love for him and if he was saved. And I remember sitting with him in the hospital and my kids were on the bed next to me coloring and coloring books and him saying, I just hope I get to go to heaven. And I said, David, don't you know what you're one in Jesus. God's adopted you as his son. You know what Jesus has done for you, right? And he was just despondent. And so I started to really worry and pray fervently for him because I thought, what a toll has this taken on him and what a toll does illness take on us when it screens us from our vision of God's love. We might know it. He knew it deep down. And so I really started to worry and wonder and just prayed fervently. And then he had one after another week of being very confused and delirious in his last few weeks of life. But he had one day of clarity. And that day of clarity, he called me. And he sounded like a new man. And he said to me, I know it's going to be okay. And he said, I was waking up this morning and I remembered Isaiah, I think it was chapter 6, when Isaiah comes into the temple and he witnesses God there on the throne and his robe, just the hem of his robe fills the temple. And it's one of those scenes that Isaiah was terrified in the presence of this mighty God and says, woe is me because I'm unclean. But David remembered that scene and said that he felt that God had given him that scene in that moment. And he says, I know that God is close and he's so much closer than any of us realizes. And he was able to say that and draw comfort from that, pas that passage because he knew that in Jesus, he was clean and he would be in the presence of this holy God when he left this earth. And he said, he said, Katie, you and your family have been a light of grace in my life. And I just thank you. And I know that whatever happens, I'm scared. I don't want to be in pain. I don't want to go through it. But I'm not scared of where I'm going. And I know that I'll be with Jesus. And it was one of those moments where it had been six months of this poor man suffering and in turmoil. But God broke through and just showed that, no, he had David in the palm of his hand the whole time. Even with all the back and forth to the hospital in his despair, he never let go of him. And David declined then the next day and was admitted to hospice care. And his one fear about dying had been he didn't want to die alone. So his pastor and his friends, including us, we stayed beside him for the next 48 hours singing hymns and praying over him. And then he passed into Jesus' arms. So it was an uh, agonizing process to watch, but it was just such a comfort to know that God had him and God was faithful to him to the end.
Wow, what a wonderful reminder of the solid rock we have in Jesus and in His Word. You know, ultimately, we're not the ones holding fast to Christ. He's the one holding fast to us. It's worth asking, though, if your soul were a boat, and if you answered with complete transparent honesty, where is the boat of your heart anchored? To what or to whom? If we're holding on to anything other than Jesus and the Word for our ultimate security, then our boat's in danger of drifting into dangerous waters. I hope you'll pray and ask God to show you ways you can return to the safety and solidity of a soul anchored to Him. Can you believe today's the last day of October? I mean, it seems like it was just yesterday that we started seeing pumpkin spice everything in the stores, and that was back in what, mid-August? Hmm. Well, tomorrow starts November, and just 30 days later, it'll be December 1st. I'm getting excited already. Have you thought about how you'll decorate? I mean, most of us have some decorating ruts we get into every year, like this is where the manger scene goes, and this is where we put the tree. Well, would you like to add some wonderful inspirational cards to your Christmas decorations this year? I would love to send you a set of 31 tabletop advent cards from Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth. She wrote a devotional book called Born a Child and Yet a King, and these cards have pithy quotes from that book, along with a Bible verse. The cards are dated, one for each day in December, so it's like a decoration in your home, but a decoration with meaning, with significance, and with a nice little stand to hold them up. Here's how I can get them to you. They're our thank you gift for your donation of any amount to support the outreaches of Revive Our Hearts. To give, just visit reviveourhearts.com or call us at 1-800-569-5959. Be sure to ask about the Advent tabletop cards when you do. That number again is 1-800-569-5959. How would you say your heart is doing when it comes to contentment? If you're like me, your heart could probably use some work in that department. Tomorrow, Melissa Kruger will be here to show us that even though we live in a covetous world, it is possible to cultivate a heart of contentment. She'll show us how, starting tomorrow on Revive Our Hearts. Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, calling you to anchor your soul to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.